Okay, hi guys. So, imagine, it's year 2019. So, a much more simpler time, right? So, it was before COVID, it was before at least two Olympics, and it was before the latest Log4j incident. A time of innocence and joy. So, uh, this is where we travel back in time. Uh, one day, you're just another software development partner going into another interesting challenge. You find a partner, they are capable of paying their bills on time, they have interesting technical challenges for you, and it seems like it would be a cool new adventure. So you step in unknowingly. Then, gasp. Yes, gasp. You find yourself as their new chief technical officer, and you're wondering, how did I get here? So you're no longer in a situation where you can go, if they don't listen to me, then it doesn't matter. You're no longer in a place of this comfortable disassociation where you can say, you know what, this is uh, not really my circus. These are not really my monkeys. If they get it wrong the first time, if they just don't want to listen to me, then odds are pretty good that in two years, they'll come back to me. I can go, I told you so. And then they can pay me again for doing the thing right uh, the second time that I told them about the first time. So, no longer do I have this option. If I get it wrong the first time, nobody's going to pay me for doing it again the second time. Now, in fact, it is my circus. These are my monkeys. All of them, regardless of the questionable development practices or the complicated uh, business processes, all of it is mine. And I have to figure out how to sort through all of it. So when I started trying to figure out what to talk to you guys about today, then I made myself this beautiful plan. It looked gorgeous. Of course, as soon as I started actually trying to work myself through it, it completely fell apart. It uh, did not uh, stand a chance at actually uh, getting, getting me through this day to day. And I think that's sort of a beautiful parallel or a beautiful uh, like parable for what we do in software development on a daily basis. Essentially, even the best laid plans don't uh, live through the first encounter with the enemy. And yes, in this case, you guys are the enemy. So, uh, when I was building uh, this talk, then uh, I thought about my last three years as a freshly minted CTO in, uh, in, in InBank, and I figured that's something that I could maybe talk to you about, you about and uh, give you some of the lessons that I learned during this time. So, uh, I'm going uh, at this from uh, mostly uh, a journey perspective, and I invite all of you to essentially join me on it. So I think it's 2019, you're mostly shaped like me, and you're a new CTO. And you find yourself uh, leading a uh, company that has been around for 10 years. It has a relatively small software development team, and suddenly you have to force this, this team through a fairly aggressive scale-up in a situation where the organization itself is uh, business-forward, not technology-forward. Now, what do I mean when I say business forward instead of technology forward? After all, aren't all organizations primarily business forward? Aren't they all here trying to make money? Yes, they are. But when I'm saying uh, business forward instead of technology forward, I mean companies that uh, uh, have technology at their core, but do they do not have technical competence or technical founders uh, sort of baked into their managerial setup. They don't speak the same language as engineers do. So uh, just to give you a bit of background about myself, uh, it's fairly linear. It's not all that exciting. I have a master's degree from uh, Tallinn University of Technology in information technology. I started my career as a uh, banking software analyst. Then I moved on to uh, being a web development analyst for a major uh, telecommunications provider. I had a small detour as a web development architect uh, in a naval GPS provider located in Italy. And then I circled my way back uh, under the moniker of Hooligan, which was, uh, or still is, my own software development company back in 2015. And then we started working with telcos and uh, different organizations trying to build stuff for their software development needs. In 2019, when I walked into InBank, uh, having been invited by a senior developer I'd worked with for a fairly long time, I didn't know what I was walking into. I thought it would just be another project. 
But uh, we, we went there with my fairly small team at the time, and uh, very quickly what ended up was uh, we ended up taking uh, the role there as uh, like full-time employees, not just partners. Uh, what I learned uh, during that uh, period are the things that I'm trying to impart to you now. And InBank itself is an organization that has been around since 2010. It's active in uh, four markets. It's uh, what you'd call a challenger bank. Uh, so we do primarily business to business to consumer lending. It uh, has been successful in this space. It has shown itself as, uh, at times, a technological innovator. Uh, and, uh, well, it's been around for the, over 10 years, so we're doing good, right? So, uh, I won't ta take you through the entire uh, like journey of how we turned around the tech team uh, in InBank. Uh, this is, uh, if, you, if you're curious, then I talked about this during the last Eli Elisa Tech Day, so you can go listen to that one. However, I would like to uh, focus on some of the learnings that I particularly got uh, over the last couple of years as a freshly minted CTO. So, uh, when we're talking about a situation where you're primarily in an organization that doesn't speak your language, then what happens is you end up doing a lot of translating. You find yourself in a managerial body that does not understand that you're telling them and that might not understand what you're trying to tell them either. So uh, you don't speak the same language, but you have to learn really quickly because unless you learn to speak their language, then you won't get anything done. Sometimes you just feel like some sort of a mumbling idiot in the corner trying to send smoke signals and explain yourself, talking about the differences between deployments and uh, releases or uh, why we shouldn't put all of the data into the same exact table, even if it is easier to find in one place. Uh, but unless you learn how to do this translation, then uh, you're going to be in for a bad time because they won't give you the space or the opportunity to, do the, to make the necessary changes. So, one of the first things that we needed to do when we uh, went to rebuild the development team or change the development team in InBank was that uh, uh, we discovered that unless there is a development culture in place, then you have to build it yourself. So, when I'm talking about development culture, then uh, it's one thing if you're in an organization that uh, as I said, speaks your language. So if the founders are techies, if it's been built up on a foundation of technological understanding, uh, then everybody's basically on the same page. You have uh, certain uh, things that are normal for you, that you walk into an organization uh, that does technology and you go like, yes, I understand this. Some of these may include things like uh, people understanding that doing code reviews might be as important, if not more important, than writing the code itself. You might have an understanding that you're trying to do deploys as often as you possibly can with, with uh, small independently releasable bits uh, that uh, don't disrupt uh, your business too often. So you try to get stuff out as fast as you can, right? You also expect there to be a lively and constant debate about how to make our architecture better, how to improve things from a technical perspective, not just about how to get stuff out of the door faster. Now, while this last point is incredibly important, then without the latter, you can't do the former. So you have to understand how to uh, build correctly, how to have a culture that allows for building, uh, how to uh, keep an eye on your uh, technical depth, and how to give time to actually manage that for you to be able to deliver faster, right? All of this sounds normal for most of you, I hope. So, but if you find yourself in an organization that doesn't have that baked into their DNA, then you, our fresh new CTO, have to start grafting it in place. You have to take the knowledge that you've gotten from previous places, and you have to somehow shove it into this organization, while having a situation where the management board might not completely understand why it is that you're trying to do this. So you have to explain, and you get to a point where they perhaps understand what it is that you're mumbling about. So one of the first things that we did uh, was we had a tech week. So a tech week for us uh, was something out of necessity. What I mean by tech week uh, is that we took all of the developers who'd been there for a while, we sat them down with developers who'd never been there, and then we asked them to go through bits of the domain and explain what it is that this thing does. Because it seemed that nobody very much understood what our processes or what our services looked like. And if you're a software person, and you walk into a situation like that, then you're like, that's kind of scary. We should fix that. 
So uh, this first tech week came out of necessity. We had everybody document and later present. We had a show and tell, and we learned a lot about the stuff that we're working with. After that, we managed to make this into a quarterly thing. So every quarter, we put a week of time aside and just do te tech stuff. We have talks, we do proof of concepts, we patch things, uh, we worry about our technical backlogs, etc. So this was one step that got us closer to this 30% uh, time that each and every software company should put aside to make sure that their stuff doesn't fall apart a little bit later down the line. Another, another thing that we did was uh, implementing Fixits, which is sort of a miniature version of that, and in general sort of foster a situation where we understand that technical upkeep is as important as uh, writing new stuff. At least 30% of the time it should be as important. So. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is obviously uh, creating a software development culture isn't just about uh, giving time for technical upkeep. It's about how you communicate with people overall. It's about what kind of rituals you put in place, your stand-ups, your weeklies, your plannings, your groomings, etc., etc., your team events, uh, your random parties, your walks through the zoo, whatever. But if you're in an organization that doesn't have that, then maybe you're in a situation that you have to create it for your own organization as a separate pocket. Sometimes it might look like you have a different uh, world from the rest of the organization, and uh, in this situation, that might just be fine. That might just have to be something that you need to do to make sure that you're able to actually deliver the way you want to deliver, and you're expected to deliver. So, what I'm getting at is, uh, if the kind of development culture you're looking for isn't there, then like a fungus, it should very quickly grow. Throw some yeast on it, do something. Essentially, uh, build the kind of culture that you want to work in and do it fast. Because despite how good your developers are, then if you don't have this uh, sort of ecosystem in place, then the result will still suck. Now, uh, another thing that I learned uh, during my three years is that uh, as much as you have to be uh, careful about uh, giving the right kind of information to your team, you also have to be careful about not giving the wrong kind of information. So you have to uh, essentially deploy your uh, concrete umbrella every now and then. You have to uh, take in the information that you get, uh, talk, uh, talk it through, perhaps, with people who uh, uh, would understand the circumstances a little bit as well, and then decide whether or not you want to actually give or impart this to your team. Now, I'm not saying you need to hide information from your team. Well, I guess I am, right? But what I mean, essentially, at the uh, bottom of this, is uh, if you get some sort of information, uh, then for me, the question I ask myself is, if I share this with people, does it help or does it hurt? Now, if it helps, the, I mean, does it uh, increase our motivation? Does it clarify our understanding of our strategy? Does it take us closer to the sort of software or business architecture that we're trying to get that? Does it uh, give us the opportunity to move faster, stronger, better, etc.? Or does it not? Does it sap our motivation? Does it make us question what we're building? Does it make us uh, confused, angry, and discombobulated about what it is that we're doing on a daily basis? So I am looking for information that does not confuse, anger, and discombobulate. If I have this kind of information, I try to uh, work with it until it no longer does these three things. And uh, unless, I, uh, unless I can do that, then uh, that I shouldn't be sharing this, or I should find a way how to mitigate this information somehow. So I have a bit of a story for this. Uh, uh, basically, uh, what I'm getting at is uh, sometimes you have to use a lot of filters. This is an image of a lot of filters, by the way, if you're not uh, aware. Uh, these might be different people. These might be different uh, departments. Uh, this must, might be information that you've garnered from somewhere else to figure out whether or not uh, you uh, can share your news, whether or not you should be using it in the way that it was given to you. So uh, one of our cases was that a couple of years ago, we had a really big project that we were working on. And by really big, I mean it took like 
eight to nine months of development from multiple teams. Uh, it had a uh, budget of uh, something to the tune of a quarter million, which for us at the time was a large amount of money. And not only would it need us to work at it for almost a year, it would also take the rest of the organization to take two or three months out of their time to be able uh, to actually implement this. So it was sort of a tech plus business situation that would provide us with a yearly uh, three quarters of a million savings if we could turn it around. So when we started looking at it, it was a no-brainer, right? Everybody had, uh, like, uh, everybody pushed for it. It seemed like a good idea. We got working on it. Now, uh, let's uh, fast forward to about five months later. Five months later, something happened. I don't remember what it was. But basically, the organization said, stop. We cannot do this right now. We do not have the three months that we need to actually implement this from a business perspective. We need to put our lawyers, our operations people, our customer service into something else. We need to come back to this next year. We, however, on the development side, are six months into this journey. If we stop it now, then what happens? You drop a project that you've been working on for six months, you come back to it a year later, Nobody understands what you did six, uh, this uh, one year ago. So you, your options are either you finish it or you bake it into the uh, plan that you essentially end up spending way more time on it than you originally thought you would. So what we did was uh, we looked at the project, went, you know, we're still going to need uh, the uh, functionality at one point. So instead of saying to the dev team, hey, I understand that you've been working on this for six months, but we're not going to do it. Uh, then uh, what we went with was that we will do it. The implementation from a business perspective will come much later, uh, and uh, we'll deal with the consequences as they come. Then another three months later, or I think two months, uh, our business counterparties came back and they went, amazing. We no longer have the problem due to which we couldn't implement this uh, awesome, cool, money-saving uh, project that we had. Now we need it in one month's time, which otherwise would have been impossible. But I got to go. Excellent, I've had it all along. So, uh, development team came out as kings, we had uh, provided uh, the thing on time, and everybody clapped and uh, enjoyed. But in an opposite case, if we'd just gone with uh, basically what we were told, taking it uh, in an unaltered form, and said, we're stopping this, then chaos, destruction, war, pestilence would have followed. So, essentially, Use your filters, figure out what is uh, good to tell and what is not good to tell at which times. Now, uh, as a manager of people, I have found that it's very important now that I figure out how I spend my time. So it's, uh, it's not just about uh, putting as much time into things as I possibly can, because time is a limited uh, thing. It's a limited resource. You only have so much of it. And uh, us as engineers, it's even on my shirt, right? So I must be one. Uh, the, uh, us as engineers, we tend to go, we tend to go for things that we uh, personally enjoy doing more. So probably, if you're a strong specialist, then you got here by being very good at what you do. I hope so. And this is also the building block for what gets you further in your career. So you got into whatever leading position that you're in due to the fact that you're very good at what you do. But now, when you take a managerial role, then you find out that these things that made you excellent at your job no longer matter, because you don't have the same kind of time to put into the stuff that you actually enjoy, which is engineering. You no longer can do that as much as you would like. Why is that? Well, because uh, it's no longer just about you. Now you have a whole flock of people. You might have uh, tens or like, you might, might have a couple or tens or hundreds of people who depend on you to show them the direction, to show them the way, to be the lead uh, goose on that image I showed you previously, to uh, direct them in the right direction. Uh, so if you put your head down and just focus on uh, the stuff that you enjoy, which is the cool engineering bit, then uh, you get enjoyment out of it. But the team gets very little. They just get what uh, one talented engineer might be able to provide. However, if you take the time... Well, and uh, one thing I wanted to say was that uh, as an engineer, you want to put your head down. You want to spend most of your time there. But you don't have time for that. For me, my happy place is finding really ugly databases or really crappy APIs and making them not suck. But I can't anymore. I have to let others do it. So uh, these days, uh, 
I understand that my impact can be much bigger if I mentor, if I teach others, because there's so many more of them than there is of me. So if I put the same energy into mentoring, recruiting, creating a sort of uh, uh, software ecosystem or a development culture that allows all of this good stuff to happen, then they will be able to do it way better than I will be. So I have to suck it up and live with the, the consequences of being as good as I am at my job and getting to where I was. Now, why, what I'm saying is uh, not that you should stop being an engineer. In fact, you have to be a better engineer than you were before, because now everyone's following your lead. But you have to be very mindful of how you spend your time now. So instead of uh, maybe putting 60% of your time into the code, if you're, of course, in a situation where you can, then kudos to you. Uh, but uh, in often cases, when you end up as a manager, then you no longer have this, this possibility. So instead of putting 60% of the time in, maybe put 20% of the time in. Uh, for me, it was very important to keep at least one passion project for myself, so I wouldn't get completely lost, so I wouldn't lose that which uh, tied me to the stuff that I actually love. Uh, so I, I have always kept like a passion project on the side. For this time, for the last three years, I've been trying to make our internet banks uh, into one instead of uh, three or four. So uh, I went at it from the perspective of she who controls the APIs controls the world. So uh, we've been fixing the internet bank and the APIs, and this is something that I do sort of as a uh, hobby. But uh, I do it as a part-time thing. I can't put all of my focus into it, even though I might have wanted to. Uh, but this keeps me grounded. So I would suggest uh, every now and then tracking your time for a week, seeing where your time goes, and then looking at it from a third-party perspective going, if I was a team lead, which I am, or a CTO, which hypothetically all of you are, then is this way that I'm spending my time the best way that I could spend it considering my team? Is this giving us the best opportunity for a leap forward? Or is it actually holding us back, but it feels nice and safe and cuddly for me? Because sometimes the stuff that I have to do is scary and or boring. So if you do that sort of analysis for yourself, then maybe the picture will be a little bit uh, clearer. Now, behind me, is a slide of the 11 principles of armed forces leadership. I assume very few of you thought that they would be coming in today and seeing stuff about military doctrine. However, here it is. Why I'm bringing you this is because uh, we were talking about uh, problems with uh, language and translation, right? So there are uh, people working with us who uh, do something completely different from uh, what we understand. But if we start looking at it a little bit deeper, we might find that uh, the way they approach things, uh, then uh, the way they approach things or the way they solve problems, they uh, phrase it differently, but the concepts are the same. Also, why the 11 principles of armed forces leadership? Because you are a leader now, you are a manager. And regardless of what kind of field you're in, some of the same rules, some of the same structures, some of the same expectations still apply. Uh, I think my favorite one is the one in the middle, number six. I think all of them are relevant, read them through. Think about it, I think you'll see that in uh, most cases in your work, uh, they might be more, more relevant actually than you ever thought they would. So, uh, what else do I, did I want to tell you? Basically, if you're in a situation, like if you put yourself in a situation where you manage to deliver, then you have to explain yourself less. To be able to deliver, then that means that you have to set up the kind of culture that allows you to deliver. This means that you have uh, gotten the right kind of people, you've given them an opportunity to show you their best side, you've given them enough space to grow, but you've also uh, given them enough, uh, enough of a box that they know in which they can thrive, in which they can be a beautiful fungus and uh, spread. Uh, you have to uh, be careful about how you spend your time. So uh, not only do you have to keep in mind that which you would like to do, but you have to keep in mind that which would uh, be a positive impact to the team overall, the team overall, and of course the organization overall. So your time management becomes much more important than it did when you were just one engineer amongst many engineers. 
there's going to be a lot of translation that you need to figure out. Sometimes you will be in the corner sending smoke signals, making dance moves, and hoping that somebody understands. But if you don't do it, then you'll just be another T-shirt in a room of suits and ties that nobody comprehends. And you don't want to be there if you're one of the people who uh, wants to or needs to uh, guide the management or the organization in a path that would lead to, to excellence from your perspective or from the organization's perspective overall. So you want to do the best that you can for uh, your software family to thrive, and for that you need to speak the language of those who don't speak yours. And finally, when you're in doubt, then you can always go back to tried and true doctrines of uh, military leadership or uh, regular business leadership and uh, use those uh, rules and regulations sort of to guide you through. In uh, software development, in management, uh, as much as everything else, uh, there's sort of a situation where everything falls into a pattern. If you figure out the pattern, if you figure out the function, you can figure out what the result would be. If you know your result, then your only question is what kind of a function do you need to use to get there? Uh, in our case, uh, or in my case as a CTO over this three-year journey with, uh, on which you all have uh, come with me, uh, the key components were allowing uh, or uh, creating a team and development culture that allowed us to thrive being careful about my own time management and understanding how I can make the biggest impact on the team, learning to uh, speak the language of those uh, who don't speak mine, and generally making uh, a good impression and uh, making a good impression on uh, those who have to work with us, so sort of disseminating the culture onto others as well. And of course, uh, as a key part of it, uh, we had to figure out which kind of information is safe to share and what kind of filtering do you need to use. So these are essentially uh, the rules by which we made it. And I promised that I'd tell you about uh, how to make lemonade. So for lemonade, you take sugar, you take lemons, you squeeze them, you have lemonade. So this has been my talk. My name is Aet and thank you very much for listening to me and coming on this journey with me. <laughs>